you can be as active as you want, as happy uh, on the outside, eat tons of kale and drink banana smoothies, um, but you might not lose weight or you might not gain weight or have still have certain health issues. often ask me this question, what is the easiest, quickest, how did you lose weight? So you did keto, right? Exactly why it doesn't work for you. It's not sustainable. It's too expensive. I don't like the food. It requires exercise. It requires too much meal prepping. What's the reason? How your body responds, how it affects your sleep cycle. In women, how does it affect, affect their menstrual cycle? Hi guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. Um, I have my good friend here, uh, Alex Brandis, to talk about nutrition for today. And um, I can guarantee you, we got, we're, both of us, all of us are going to learn something new and a lot today. Um, so here we go. Uh, so Alex, uh, welcome to the channel. Welcome to... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> what a pleasure to be on the Justin Lee method. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Ah, you're welcome. Um, no, thank you actually for being here, spending some time with us. Sure. Uh, sure. Would you uh, would you tell us about yourself, please? Sure. Um, there's a a long history, but to cut it short, um, in the last several years, I've been um, looking into nutrition, and due to some of my own health problems, and since I have four children. Um, and understanding more and more how it impacts our lives. So uh, I studied at IAN, and for people who don't know what that is, that's Integrative uh, Institute of Nutrition. It's in America. Um, it's an online course that I finished over the year, and um, it was just life-changing. Some of the teachers were like um, Mark Hemway. Um, Mark Hemway, is that how you say his name? Um, Michael uh, Gregor, um, the guy who wrote How Not to Die. Um, it was just an amazing course that opened my eyes to what nutrition exactly is and how it's different from people to people and culture to culture, country to country. Yeah, so um, that's my background in nutrition. All right. Um, and you said uh, you, you had some health issues that made you um, got, got you really yes. interested or curious about it. Yes. Do you yes. want to talk to us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it actually started with uh, having a C-section with my firstborn. And following that, I was pregnant again very quickly. And I was told that I would need another C-section. And um, I had moved to Dubai by then. And my doctor at the time suggested that I look into nutrition. And I could not understand how giving birth, nutrition, how is it even connected? <laughs> and um, so that's how I started researching it. And before I knew it, he was right. I was able to have natural birth for the next three children with no problems. Um, oh. And again, throughout the, the history of this, I also found that I had a stage three cervical cancer. And again, it was the same doctor that helped me and brought me back into line saying, remember we talked about nutrition? So that's what got me into looking into Colin Campbell, um, Deepak Chopra. Many people know these famous names. They're very motivational and, you know, but they talk a lot about nutrition as well. And that's when I came across IAN and that kind of brought it all together for me. All right. Yeah. Um, how long we usually is the... Uh how do you say the course or what you took? How long does it take? And yeah, it's a, it, it's a year course and throughout the year you have different modules. Um, and at the end of every 10 module, it's in total 40 weeks. Let's put it that way. So there's 10 modules at a time. And at the end of each 10, you have an assessment and the assessment involves, um, the knowledge of those 10 units that you've studied. And each unit has a different teacher. 
So they all talk about their own practices, their own experiences. And some of these people are doctors, professors, scientists, um, athletes, uh, competitors, and just motivational speakers. So what this course did for me in the end, and that I think that's the aim of the course, was to give you a holistic approach and how you learn how you can use nutrition as a part of your life. Um, basic example, we were chatting about this a couple of days ago. You can be as active as you want, as happy uh, on the outside, eat tons of kale and drink banana smoothies, um, but you might not lose weight or you might not gain weight or have still have certain health issues. And the holistic approach really brings all of these factors together. It looks into hormones. It looks into your environment. It looks at your heritage. Um, and all of them are really quite important. I can go into detail if you wish. Um, yeah. Well, well, the thing is, first, uh, personally, when I hear holistic, it's, uh, mm. it's kind of feels like it's out there. So, um, yeah, like when you think about nutrition, you would think it's more like into science, you know, like, uh, yes. <laughs> uh yes. yeah, more into science. So yeah. can you, can you describe a little bit more about why, sure. why it's more holistic? Okay. Okay. So when we use the term holistic, what we mean is not necessarily, not that I'm against it, but it's not hippie dippy stuff. Okay. So holistic is, it's, it's a whole so we look at someone's diet or nutrition and what did you eat today? I ate such and such and such. Okay. How did you feel after you ate? Okay. Um, what is your go-to food when you feel depressed? Such and such. Okay. So where were you born? And all these questions gives us an understanding of this per person's internal and external state. So from such information, I can suggest that this person might need to get a blood test done. Maybe there's an insulin problem. I can suggest that um, maybe they need to connect with their culture a little bit more. Say I'm born in Turkey. When I'm down, my go-to food is what my mum cooks, beans and rice. Why does my body create, crave that? Is it my body craving that? Or is there some kind of a desperation there to get back to comfort? You know what I mean? Um, and yeah. so when you put emotional comfort and so on. So um, when you put all of these together, that gives you the holistic approach. So it is still science-based. Um, there are still questions out there that I wouldn't be able to answer and I would have to recommend a person to go see a GP generally. That's what I would recommend. Um, but without one or the other, it just doesn't work. As simple as that. I simply put, let's say. Right. And um, so we're basically talking about mental, mentally and emotionally. Um, it like, involves the mental and emotional state of the person. So, yes. and you also talked about no matter how much you eat, how much kale you eat or you know, all of this, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it doesn't really work when your mental or emotional state is not okay. Of course. Let's, let's look at it from this point of view. Um, say you are feeling really down, but you're, you're determined. You get up, you go for a walk, you exercise, whether it's yoga, weightlifting and so on. But you just can't lose weight. And you tried keto. You went vegan. You tried high carb. You tried low carb. And it's just not working. So what's, what could be the problem there? It could be as simple as cortisol issue. Maybe your stress levels are so high, therefore the hormones have kicked in and they do not allow you to lose weight. Our brain does not perceive stress as I'm stressed at work, I'm lifting weights, that's a stress, or I haven't had enough sleep. Our brain perceives stress as stress and therefore releases the same chemicals, combinations of chemicals and so on. Now, therefore, if you're not identifying that particular issue, um, it doesn't matter which diet you follow or how much kale you ate, um, you're just not going to feel the best that you can feel. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yep. I'm just thinking, so 
if um, you, you said something like if a person wants to lose weight or uh, I've spoken mm. to some people who wants to gain weight as well and yet they don't. Yes. And mm. if you're saying that maybe, and I think a lot of people are really stressed in this uh, modern times. Sure. Um, all the pressure from work or family and yeah. whatnot. So mm. as a nutritionist, if they are mm. struggling to, let's say, let's just say lose weight and mm -hmm. If they have something more outside the nutrition side, what, what would you normally mm. advise them to do? Okay, um, I would ask them a series of questions. One of them, the first one I would say is, um, say you decided I'm going to try this diet. How long did you stick to it? Three days, four days, a month? And how consistent were you? Did you keep a diary? Did you keep a journal so that you can go back and say, mm, today, I remember that day, I ate this, three hours later, I felt horrible. I had indigestion or I couldn't sleep or something. So did you stick to the diet? Have you kept a diary? Why do you think this diet didn't work for you? And these three questions are really the core questions because everyone is different. Um, I'll, I'd like to give you an example about weight loss in particular. Um, after the fourth kid, I tried anything and everything, and the heaviest I've ever been in my life was 108 kilos, I think. That's big. I mean, I'm only 1.68. So I was carrying a lot of weight. I was trying and sticking to diets up to 30 days, exercising, like killing myself, six, seven times uh, a week, sometimes more. And the weight was just not dropping off at all. I was get, gaining muscle mass, but not losing fat. And I decided to go and get checked up and see what's wrong. And I found out that I had an insulin problem. So the weight gain really was not going to go anywhere unless that particular problem was resolved. So that's a chemical compound in this whole holistic thing. Okay. Right? What do I need to do to drop insulin? What can I do naturally to drop? First, I did low carb and I started seeing small results. But when I completely cut the carbs out, um, I lost about 35 kilos. That wow. worked for me. Yeah. And that was in a very short period of time. That worked for me because I had a particular issue and I targeted that specific issue. So now somebody that I meet often ask me this question, what is the easiest, quickest, how did you lose weight? So you did keto, right? Right. But I had an insulin problem. Do you have an insulin problem? We're not from the same background. We're not, ourselves are not uh, friends with each other. You have them in your body. I have them in my body, right? Like the way my body is going to respond to a certain input is going to be very different to how yours respond. You can try it, but first you need to be consistent. You need to keep a diary and you need to see exactly why it doesn't work for you. It's not sustainable. It's too expensive. I don't like the food. It requires exercise. It requires too much meal prepping. What's the reason? So then we can get to the core issue. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people uh, tend to lose weight very easily um, when they're on a very basic diet of natural foods. And by natural foods, I mean things that don't come, come out of a packet, right? Cheese, is cheese good for you? Is it bad for you? Vegan, non-vegan, all sorts of controversy around that, right? But if you're eating cheese that just came out of a wrapper, that's one thing, but you're eating feta cheese, that's something else that's cultured and has probiotics and, and so on, unless it's been processed again. So I think if people look at it from that point of view where you're eating clean, non-processed foods, small amounts, not indulging excessively, you will drop the weight that doesn't belong to your body. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, what you think about dieting and the keto. Um, mm. But I had a question in mind. Um, you talked about like ancestral or um, mm. let's say genetics. Yeah. 
like you said, you're from yeah. Turkey. And because uh, I read mm. somewhere that, like for me as an Asian, um, my mm-hmm. ancestors probably ate a lot of rice. <laughs> okay. China study, right? It's, that book is magic, by the way. Oh, yeah? Okay. Good. Uh, we're going to yeah. include that in the, in the description later. Um, so does, does that have anything to do with um, like how we process the food? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Um, a lot of cultures that eat a lot of rice tend to have a small amount of something else next to the rice. And it's generally not overly oily. Say, for example, if you're going to have rice, you're not going to have a Big Mac with it, right? You're going to have maybe fish. You're going to have maybe chicken. You might even have French fries, but your main meal is the rice. Yeah. Yeah, everything is incorporated into that. Um, Our bodies, our, our cells... Just like muscle memory, they have a memory and they remember what they've been consuming, what's been given to them and how to turn that into energy, how to burn that. So when you introduce McDonald's to China, suddenly there's heart attacks, there's obesity, there's there's, um, cancer. But for so many years, these people were living on rice and nobody was up in arms saying carbs are bad, you know, go low carb. There was nothing wrong. But it started to change when food combination was shifted from what they're used to eating to what they're now not used to eating, what's advertised to eat. And I think, again, it's something that's uh, incredibly important to keep in mind just food combination, Um, what to combine, what not to combine, what feels good for you and what makes you feel sick. Mm. Well, um, it's a little bit out of topic. However, um, like mm. I live in Dubai right now, but I'm a Filipino. Mm. And normally I mm. ask or I get to talk to some Filipinos back in Philippines that mm. as much as I want to suggest to them how to eat um, mm. whole foods or you know, a non-processed food, the cost is mm. always, always there. Mm. Like... Sometimes junk food or fast food is even the cheapest mm. option than eating a salad of or course. greens. Yes. What, mm. do, what do you think about that? What can, we, what can we advise or suggest to them they can do? Well, I would look at the cheapest vegetables available. Um, so I think it was called the 30K diameter. Uh, there's, a, there's a study. So you live wherever you live and uh, to get the... Mm, basic health and the most beneficial um, health benefits is to look at your 30 kilometer radius and what is growing there, right? If it's an orange and it's imported and you can't afford it, that's beyond the 30K limit anyway, right? So garden vegetables, things that are the cheapest, that are in season, that are fresh and try not to indulge too much in the cheaper and attractive foods, um, takeaways, KFC, you know, um, all these kind of things, they are very accessible in, in our face. And it takes a bit more time to prepare fresh fruits and vegetables, but it's just much healthier for you. And there must be options. Um, sweet potatoes, well, potatoes is better than deep fried mackets chips. Right. So I think it's just choices, like making clever choices, affordable choices. Agreed. All right. So mm-hmm. let's. Um, I wanted to talk about the diet and keto. Um, sure. I think nowadays keto has been mm. has got a lot of popularity, and um, it's a buzzword. <laughs> I, personally, I've uh, I've studied about it. Um, how mm. basically keto is getting your body into ketosis that's why you go go down to really low carbs so your mm-hmm. body takes the or converts the, the fats into glucose that's basically right. what i understand from it um but as you fats said into energy yeah it burns the fats as opposed to burning carbs yeah um mm. and what do you what do you think about this keto diet or a mm. diet in general mm. Well, um, from personal experience, 
like I said, I, I hear it almost daily when people are messaging me on Food and Fitness Diary or my friends or family. So I'm on a keto diet and it's been like two weeks and I'm not losing any weight. If you really want to be on a keto diet, it is so tedious, it is so difficult to do, and it takes dedication, right? So the true keto diet is five grams, five net grams of carbs a day. Then based on your body height, BMI and so on, then you figure out protein amounts and fat amounts and so on. But you start with five grams of carbs, not much fat, and you start to get your body into ketosis. Can you follow that through forever? Well, if I was to eat a cashew, a single cashew, I would weigh it, I would calculate it, I would enter it into my fitness pal, and if it was, before I was even going to eat it, if it was 0.3 grams too much, I wouldn't eat it. Because I wanted to lose that weight, right? I wanted to break this insulin cycle. I really wanted to do it. If I had romaine lettuce and iceberg lettuce, I would check them both out, weigh them both, see which is the lowest in carbs, iceberg or romaine lettuce, like, right? So it's not a sustainable diet. It's not. You can't live like that forever. However, low carb is a lot more manageable. And low carb, in my opinion, pushes you towards clean eating a lot more. You have to pick wisely what, what, is, what is low carb. Should I have a slice of bread or maybe I can have a couple of slices of uh, sweet potato grilled? I would prefer the sweet potato. Those are the choices then you start to make as you understand more and more about carbs and so on. Um, yeah, it's not sustainable. Having said that, you said, well, or, or any other diet, Unless it's going to become your lifestyle, diets are just temporarily there. There is no wrong diet and there is no right diet because there's no other one like you and no other one like me. What's going to work for me may not work for my sister. What's going to work for my sister may not work for my mother, even though we are genetically connected, right? A diet is just temporary. It will work, but unless it becomes your lifestyle and you can maintain it, you can afford it, it's easily accessible, it's just temporary. Mm, Well, well, regarding to this, I think most people's problem about this is they start at a point where they're totally clueless. So they just, you know, live their life. And of course, once you Mm -hmm. you start aging, you start slowing Mm -hmm. down. And mm-hmm. what you used to eat, it's mm-hmm. it. All of a sudden, people are surprised that they are gaining weight and they mm-hmm. cannot lose it. Sure. And sure, then sure. they start looking for answers online, and mm-hmm. yeah, they, mm-hmm. all they see are these diets, and it's. I think it's misdirecting mm-hmm. them, or it's even getting them confused. So, sure. What what can they well, do look, in this I'll case? Put it, um. Again, I would ask them those three questions. Um, What diet do you want to follow? Why do you want to follow that diet? Are you ready to be committed at least for 30 days? And can you keep a logbook? So you can see what's happening to your body, how your body responds, how it affects your sleep cycle. In women, how does it affect, affect their menstrual cycle? A lot of things change with your diet, right? What you put in creates a, a, there's a, what's it called? There's a effect, right? Um, An example um, that's close to me, my husband this year is 64 years old and most of his life he has been vegetarian. When he met me, he kind of became pescatarian because I love fish so much and where I come from, fish was a lot cheaper than meat. So, and I love fish, so. Um, what started to happen later on in the relationship is he started having some issues with cholesterol and with, and with prostate. 
And now you think somebody who's a vegetarian, who's not consuming meat, how can there be cholesterol? Right? Where does cholesterol come from? Well, he was eating cheese as a vegetarian and he would love his cream and his coffee. And his age was there, right? He's 61, 62, getting there. So the things that did not bother him or affect him chemically earlier on in his life now was affecting him. Every seven years, our cells change completely and we become a new person. So what used to, every seven years, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what used to work for you seven years ago may not work for you now because you're not the same person. Looking into that, I decided to put him on a, a vegan diet. As well as vegan, I decided to increase the good fats in his diet. So more avocados, more almonds and cashews, um, avocado oil on his salad, um, lots of olive oil. Men are making him a toast instead of butter or margarine. I would put olive oil. And in three months' time, he had another checkup where I had to beg to the doctor, just don't put him on drugs just yet, please, please, let's just try this. And I got a phone call from one of the nurses that said, what have you guys done? And I still have his test results, the comparisons. She said, have you, did you put him on a low-fat diet? Like, where did all this cholesterol go? How did you do this? I was like, no, I actually did the opposite. I put him on a high-fat diet. And it was the good fat. So therefore he was getting the satisfaction of feeling full. And, you know, as opposed to full cream milk, he would have coconut cream in his coffee. So just switching the choices to what is better for your body or what's more digestible, consumable, what's not going to cause issues, let's say. How do people find this out? There's a lot of information out there. It's just trial and error because one information, that. yeah, one information, like I said, that works for me is not going to work for you, but that's why you need to stick to it for at least 30 days just to see, is it working? Because it doesn't happen overnight. If you have a resistant metabolism, which happens with age, it's not going to happen in two weeks. Um, most diets start showing results within 20, 21 days. But if you allow yourself 30 days, at least then you have a little bit of room to wiggle, right? You know, every now and then, if you want to have a cheeseburger, you can. But if you restrict yourself so much, it's possibly going to backfire. So managed to get his cholesterol levels down and his prostate started to shrink. And that's because I started cutting off um, some of the carbs that he, he loved white bread. So there was no more white bread for him. (laughs) He loved pasta. So there was no more pasta for him. There was zucchini pasta, right? Where you just make zucchini pasta. Um, Gives you the same feeling and you no longer have a prostate issue. So you really want to, it works for him, right? Yeah. And that's why I asked them, give us three months. Let me just try this. And they went, okay, try. And they were like, Whatever. Fruit loop. <laughs> Let's see what's going to happen. <laughs> it worked. Okay. So uh, it, could, it could possibly work for others. Uh, thanks for sharing that with your husband. Um, I hope he doesn't mind we talked about that. Um, no, no. We, we were talking about restrictions and uh, mm. let's say being a vegan and uh, yeah. or a vegetarian even. Uh, mm. What I've learned about this is um, or if, I don't know if it's how accurate what I learned. When you go on a vegan or a vegetarian diet, I read somewhere mm. that uh, the vitamin B12 can only be found in meat mm. and mm. you cannot get it at all from any other food source. What, what do you oh, think about that? That, that, is a, that is, I believe that is a myth. I mean, like I said, my husband has been vegetarian pretty much all his life and for the past three years or so, he's he's a vegan and he's a a weightlifter and he has absolutely no issues with vitamin B12. Um, Where do we get vitamin B12? Or where does the meat, the cow, the chicken, where, where does, how does it get into their body? 
and it comes from soil. So that's why it's really amazing if you can have local foods where you know that there's not, or there's minimal amount of pesticide, or even better if you're growing it yourself in your own garden. And the soil that's on there, if I was growing potatoes, sweet potatoes, parsley, beans, or whatever in my own garden, when I go to wash them, I wouldn't scrub them the way I would scrub them when I buy them off uh, a food store, right? I'd be perfectly happy just to rinse them off and eat them as they are. And that's where you get your vitamin B12 from. Uh, it's particularly root vegetables like carrots and beetroots and all the potatoes and those sort of varieties. Uh, they are the richest in B12. So the cow goes and munches on the grass, on the seeds, on the whatever is there. It gets the vitamin B12 into its system and then you eat the cow. So in my opinion, you can just skip the cow and just <laughs> eat the vegetable. Right. And of course, just like I said, make sure it's not full of pesticide. That's all. Mm. Yep. I guess that makes sense a lot, um, at least to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the audience. Um, when it comes to, yeah. what about carbs? Like, um, mm -hmm. you would think that carb, or what, when, you, when you look at carbs, it gives us energy because mm -hmm. it burns faster or turns to glucose faster. Um, sure. Won't you feel uh, less energy mm -hmm. when, you, when you go on a low-carb diet? Or, um, and depends, also, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, finish off. I know, you, just I, the second topic about carbs that the brain doesn't need carbs. Mm, so that's mm, yeah, let, first, the first question. Mm. Okay, uh, initially when you switch from um, a high-carb high diet to a low-carb diet, you do feel sluggish. Um, but it's just like imagine a child having no sugar ever in its life and then suddenly going to a birthday party and eating cake. It's just buzzing around, but that eases off. So it's just like that with high carb and low carb. Initially, you might feel sluggish, you might feel tired. Uh, you might even have flu-like symptoms where a bit of a runny nose or a sore throat or achy joints and stuff. Um, but once your body adjusts to that, um, you can even become what's called fat adapted. So ketosis is very fragile, right? You can only be in ketosis in a ketogenic state for a small amount of time. So the smallest thing can throw you off ketosis. But when you're on low carb, you can become fat adapted. And that means you get your energy source from fat. Once you lose all the fat that you have, say let's, let's say you're losing weight, uh, then you need to replace the fat. And that's when people consume quite a lot of olive oil and coconut oil and, and, and so on, because that's their main energy source now. Um, what was the second question? Uh, do, 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 does our brain need carbs or can we, Look, go, out? Studies, can we go without carbs? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess you can definitely go without carbs, especially with some um, seizure like symptoms that some young children have, uh, they deprive them of carbs completely and their brain function is improved. Uh, their focus is improved. Their memory has been in improved and they no longer have seizures. So technically, yes, you can absolutely survive without carbs. However, you will have to replace it with, with fat, fatty acids and, and so on. Mm. Yeah. Okay, uh, what was I going to ask you? Um, do you are you still okay? Do you want to take a break? We can continue. No, again. I'm good. Yeah, 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 no problem. Okay, so um, when it comes to carbs, and you talked about uh, feeling sluggish once they're going mm. on a low carb, uh, mm. what would you suggest for people who are undergoing that change? What can they do to minimize the sluggishness? I would suggest a lot of water. Electrolytes, um, apple cider vinegar is a gem. Um, it helps with a lot of those cravings. It, it, it helps with energy boost. And of course, there's many other benefits to it. Immune system and gut health and micro, micro bio, gut microbiome and all these things. Um, just keeping up your liquid levels. 
is a is a must. Otherwise, you will get very uh, drained and tired and so on. It's suddenly, as I mean, think about it this way: when you consume carbs, carbs hold a lot of water, right? They retain water. So when you're cutting the carbs, but you're not drinking enough water, you're not getting any electrolytes. There's nothing there like apple cider vinegar or lemon water with mint or something like that. You know, that's electrolytes there as well. Um, That's like having a huge hangover. Uh, But as soon as you start drinking lots and lots of water, that just fades away very quickly. I see. Uh, About the apple cider, I I used to take them and I even read or saw somewhere that they do suggest that Mm. for weight loss. And now I think I understand. Yeah. Uh, Do you Mm -hmm. suggest like a good time to, to take it? Then how much? Um, personally, this is my not professional, but personal opinion. There is not a good or a bad time to eat or to drink. Um, you might be eating at 11 o'clock at night and no, 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 you shouldn't be eating past 8 PM, past 6 PM. Why? You're still alive. I mean, you wake up, you continue living. You're still burning energy. In fact, when you go to sleep, you burn a lot of calories. Your brain trying to sustain and keep asleep. So in my personal opinion, um, I don't think there's a good time or a bad time to, to, to drink it. I think they say things like first thing in the morning. Um, it's just so that it becomes a habit, Right. Um, when you set goals like that, when you say things like, okay, first thing in the morning, I'm going to have apple cider vinegar and then I'm going to do a 20 minute yoga session. Then I'm ready for the day. That just puts you into routine and helps you keep up with it. Right. You have it at 10 o'clock at night. You can have it at lunch. Um, traditionally, uh, the Mediterranean countries, Italy, even parts of Turkey, France, Greece, um, they love having cider, apple cider, vinegar, um, after they have a fatty meal. So if they've had pork, if they've had um, grilled salted fish or something, and it's quite fatty, that's when they will have their salad after their protein and they will pour it all over the salad that the salad is literally swimming in it. And that helps break down fats. So therefore the meal you ate, the protein you ate is easily broken down. It's easier than if you didn't have the apple cider vinegar. But it, there's no perfect time to have it as such. Um, in that sense, uh, it doesn't have to be apple cider vinegar. It can be anything citric or acidic. Is that what you mean? I, Vinegar in general, but there are, again, types out there that are um, overly refined where when you taste it or even smell it, it burns, and you, you don't particularly want that. And if you're one of these people that are sensitive to acidic things, um, have stomach issues or gut problems in any way, you don't want to drink it or even have it in your salad if you have an empty stomach. So first eat something and then have the vinegar or apple cider vinegar or whatever it is that uh, is helping you digest the best. I was thinking like lemon or lime. Um, like when you watch, I watch cooking videos and stuff. Mm. They usually, especially cooks, like professional cooks, they will always say add yes. something citric or acidic to, sure. to, to the Sure. It just helps is break down fat. Yeah. Okay. It is almost the same. Uh, there are types of apple cider vinegar that have what they call the mother in it. So there's a culture there. Yeah. So I think that's why apple cider vinegar is a lot more popular than, say, just lemon. But absolutely anything citric after a fatty meal or a big meal, not necessarily a fatty meal, heavy protein, say, for example, a salad with lots of lemon is just perfect way to go. Um, so what, what I'm getting is there is no hard and fast rule in nutrition. Is that correct? Or Well, no, there's not. There isn't. As long as you're eating sensible, you're eating clean foods, um, you're listening to your own body about your cravings, right? So say you're craving 
uh, again, I'm going to say McDonald's, but it's like as if I'm advertising for McDonald's here. I'm not. But say you're craving McDonald's, right? Just yeah. stop and think, what, what is it that you're actually craving? Are you really craving that disgusting, greasy, horrible plastic thing? Or is it the feeling that you have that you're, you know? So do you, do you maybe miss somebody? Or have you had an argument with someone? Or is there something going on at work that you need to just chill from? Just think about the emotional reason as to why you want that. And then go and you still want it, then knock yourself out. <laughs> it's, everyone's different. I guess it goes the same way with sugar. Um, like. Sugar is addictive. It, it is absolutely addictive. And it comes from birth. Um, whether the child was breastfed or it was bottle fed, um, the first thing that the baby tastes in a mother's milk is, is the sweetness. And that bonds, that helps the baby bond with the mother. Um, if the mother is not able to breastfeed, then there's formulas out there. And if you look at it, it has sugar. And it's written as one where the glucose or whatever there is, there is sugar in there. So from birth, we want sugar. And it becomes addictive and it plays with your hormones quite a bit. Um, Bad sugar, good sugar, of course. Would you rather watermelon or an ice cream? Like, what do you think is better? Of course, you would go for watermelon, a sweet, yummy, or a sweet mango, for example. Um, but we tend to go for the ice cream, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Um, when, when we say sugar or sweet, does it make a difference if it's sucrose or like the normal white sugar that we get from from desserts, like ice cream? It, it does. It does. Um, so let's look at it this way, natural or chemical sugar, right? So refined sugar, the white refined sugar, again, is just like any other processed foods. So there's that component to it. But then there's things like xylitol, erythrol, uh, saccharin, or whatever, how, however you pronounce it. I can't say that word very well. They, they are chemical sweetness right i'm not sure what kind of effect they have on your chemical composition but i know that erythrol does not raise your blood sugar levels so if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're desperately craving um, something sweet uh, you can have erythrol with black uh, chocolate mixed with a bit of coconut milk melted and it turns into nutella and it's Delicious. It's very satisfying. If you chuck it in the freezer, it becomes um, chocolate ice cream. What does it do to your hormonal state? I'm not sure, but that's my only knowledge on that. As far as I know, it just doesn't raise your blood sugar levels, uh, but it is a chemical. Yeah. Right. Um, talking about that, I think uh, I missed to talk about uh, fasting. Would you recommend oh. fasting to absolutely to like a, as a part of nutrition? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's millions and billions of studies out there that have shown the long-term effects of fasting. Again, just like anything, there's different ways of fasting. Right? There's a water fast. There's a complete. I'm not eating anything. Uh, there's intermittent fasting and so on. All of them have their own benefit based on the individual. So for me, once a week, twice a week, I would like to have a 16 to 18 hours of no food and I just consume water. And for me, it just for cleansing purposes, just to get rid of all the junk food that I've eaten or things that I've indulged in that I didn't necessarily want it to. So I, I come to it from a health point of view. But I know a lot of people do it for weight loss. Um, it's a tricky one because you can you can starve you can starve yourself, but there are times where if you eat correctly once you've broken your fast and get the proper nutrition that you need, you're no longer starving yourself and you are um, helping break down all the, all the accumulated fat in your body. But if you're fasting all day long, 
and then you end up eating a pizza, that's when you're starving because you're not getting the amount of nutrition, the true nutrition, the all micronutrients and so on from that pizza. That, therefore, you think you're eating, but that's when you're actually starving. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Yeah, uh, so it's just picking the right way of breaking up fast, I would say. Yes, I think this is um, like evident in during how do you say it, during Ramadan when they, yeah. they they go for a full day of fast and and mm-hmm. then they just eat so much and I don't know exactly yeah. how how it affects the body, mm-hmm. but I, I could guess it the does. Same it's, it is some people actually end up putting on weight because they're starving the entire day and sixteen or eighteen hours, let's say eighteen hours. Um, and then they break their fast with bread and salami and cheese and pasta. And it's like your body cannot, cannot digest all of that. That's, that's food combination, right? There's certain amounts of um, gut bacteria and acid that can only break down so much in a certain amount of time. So if you're mixing these, these foods together, uh, some of them is just going to sit there. You're going to feel bloated. You're going to feel sick. You're not going to digest it very well. And even when you wake up in the morning, you're going to still feel like, oh, the food is still sitting there. What happened? Maybe I need a soda. Like, see the cycle? It's deadly. It's really, really tricky. So, uh, look, fasting reverses cancer cells. It, this is proven. Uh, fasting regenerates old cells. It gets rid of the old ones and makes new cells. Uh, It gives you a lot more energy and clarity because you're flushing your system. You're not putting anything in there. You're just allowing your system to do what it needs to do and rejuvenate. So there there are a lot of health benefits, but like I said, it's a very, very tricky one. If if it's not done properly, uh, you can end up feeling sick and you can get yourself in a pretty bad cycle. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, we were talking about earlier before this before this conversation uh, about men and women and how it yeah. varies because of hormones. I believe testosterone and yeah. is it only testosterone or because of estrogen also? Well, all the hormones. I mean, um, we have the women have their period cycle where um, they go up and down and flat and up and down and flat. Uh, men do that pretty much every day, right? So how does your nutrition affect that? If you want to have a more stable mind, more stable spiritual um, being in yourself, you want to be more connected, more comfortable, again, the one thing that I can say over and over again is just eat clean, yeah? So then you can predict your hormonal cycle for women, uh, reduce PMS, reduce stomach cramping, endometriosis, all these issues that women get. And for men, testosterone levels, for example, um, again, apple cider vinegar is one of them. They, they, some studies say that it helps increase testosterone levels. And then other studies have said, no, it actually decreases and calms people down. So there's controversy there as well. So again, I think it just comes down to the individual, you know, if you're eating clean, looking after yourself, consuming minimal amount of junk food and keeping those three main questions in your mind, um, you will find what suits you instead of tumbling around the internet and trying to find a proper answer and waste time and get frustrated and end up hating yourself. (laughs) So we're emphasizing here really on the individual. Like every person is different. We have our own. Very much. Uh, right. Very much. Even with the, just going quickly, going back to the main uh, male hormones, your age, uh, your genetics, your uh, level of physical activity, right? Let's take that. And let's take another individual who's from America, 15, 20 years older than you and has had a terrible diet his entire life. Now he wants to get healthy. If we look at your hormone levels from cortisol to testosterone to whatever else that is available that we can look at, we will find the difference between them. 
a, a huge difference between them. So now let's say we bring this American person into your lifestyle. You guys are eating exactly the same thing. You're exercising exactly like each other. Your sleep patterns are more or less the same. You will see that the levels will start to come closer to each other. You will start to be more chemically aligned with each other. And that is due to the holistic approach, not just the nutrition. It is your sleep. It is, um, it is your environment. It is your exercise. And of course, it is your nutrition. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's say, let's say we, get, we take this example, like uh, this guy from America comes to or lives mm -hmm. the way I do. Um, mm -hmm. How long does it usually take? Because I, I do speak to a lot of people, even my own sister, uh, struggling mm -hmm. to lose weight. And they tend mm -hmm. to um, get impatient about it because they don't probably That's know true. what to expect, how long to, like the changes mm -hmm. to start happening, especially if you've been quite overweight for a while in your experience sure. okay there are two factors there again i'm going to say that it generally takes 21 days but i prefer saying 30 days of pure commitment and uh the other factor is just left my brain <laughs> it's just the uh the setting of expectations in in someone who wants to create a change Mm. So mm. for them to start seeing changes, because I believe, yeah, one month, especially if you have a lot of weight, then you can mm. lose a lot. Then it slowly mm. plateaus. And yes. that's probably also kind of, um, uh, how do you say, discouraging okay. for most people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if people have carried a lot of weight for a very long time, again, there's cell memory. So what happens is as we start losing weight, the cell starts to lose the fat that's inside. Something has to go in there, right? Because the cell has a memory. That's where you need to drink a lot of water. So people will go, oh, hold on, my arms are measuring less, but I'm still the same on the scales. How is that? I know I lost weight. I can fit into my jeans, but I'm still 92 kilos. How is that? You're actually not. Your cells are just holding on to that water, which means you need to hang in there just a little bit longer as well because that's when you have what's called a swoosh effect. Um, it, it, swoosh effect, yeah, it's fantastic. So what happens is eventually after a certain period of time, after resisting and resisting, after your cells not wanting to lose their memorized shape and size and they finally go, fine, it's only water there and it's time to get rid of this water retention. You wake up and it's like you've lost four kilos. How is that? Mm -hmm. And it might not just be you wake up, but within a couple of days, you suddenly see a big drop. Then you get to about 10 to 12 kilo marks. Say you've lost 10 to 12 kilos. Most people right about there at stall. And again, that happens because your body is going, all right, fine, we're going to lose this amount of weight, but when we get there, that's a bit too much. Hold on there. Now, why do you want me to lose this much weight? Because I'm not used to having, you know, being like this. So it just stops everything. At that point, everyone gets frustrated. Some people hit the gym harder. Some people go to the pizza shop more, right? So it's really annoying. What do you do then? Something has to shift. And again, this then comes back to the individual. For me, if I plateau, I know for me, I need to increase my carbs. So my body thinks, oh, relax, the carbs are coming back. Let's stop stressing. You know, we're not completely deprived. And as soon as the metabolism and the chemical composition and everything relaxes, then go back to low carb. And I suddenly start losing weight again. And I've tried this with many clients. It's my experience when I was helping people lose weight. And up to 30, 35 kilos, every 10 to 12, there's a stall. 10 to 12, there's a stall. And you need to change something. For me, it was increasing the carbs. Uh, for one of my clients, it was reducing uh, the weightlifting. She was weightlifting so much that she was putting so much stress on her body. Her cortisol levels were probably up there somewhere. You know, the stress hormones. 
And again, we just talked about it before. When you've got so much stress hormones bouncing around in your body, you're not going to lose weight. So she had to back off on the exercise. As soon as she stopped for a few days, suddenly she started losing weight again. She's like, this just doesn't make sense. You know, you're meant to eat less and you're meant to work out more. Now you're telling me to eat more and work out less so I can lose weight? It's like, yeah. Counterintuitive. It's a mind game, isn't it? Yes, but it works. So the individual has to find what is it that works for them. As simple as that. Yeah. Well, I believe that frustration uh, is just so hard. I'm sure this has brought a lot of clarity for a lot of people watching this. I hope so. I hope so. I'm I'm even getting a lot of ideas in my head for people who I will be speaking to next. Also, it's really good. Um, I think uh, two more uh, vitamins. Um, Yes. What I've read or learned about, for example, vitamin C. Um, Mm -hmm. our body can only process up to 500 um, milligrams Milligrams per day yeah Yeah. otherwise Mm -hmm. all of it all the excess are being just uh, urinated or sweated out yeah or sweated out and um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to mention a specific brand but it's it's a popular brand of vitamins uh, multivitamins Mm -hmm. where they Mm -hmm. say they have all the vitamin Mm -hmm. composition components Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh what I, what I heard is legally they can mm. say that they have all the vitamins, but it's a very, very small amount. Amount, yeah. So, so what do you think about vitamin intake, like a supplement? Or should they just focus on mm-hmm. uh, natural things or like in their foods? Sure. Um, this uh, vitamins for me is a really, really big topic because it also um, – Includes superfoods. There's things like shiitake mushroom powders, uh, spirulina powders that you can incorporate into your diet, put it into your shakes, uh, pre-workout, post-workout kind of stuff. And they are essentially vitamins, right? They're superfoods. Do we really need this? When you don't feel 100%, is the time to stop and think what, what, what is it like? Is it lack of sleep? Is it my nutrition? Uh, am I eating too much fat? And again, identify as for yourself as an individual, exactly what it is that is bothering you. So let's say you're just yawning all the time and you're tired all the time. That most likely is an iron deficiency. Yeah. Taking multivitamins is only going to put pressure onto your liver and kidneys multivitamins because your body doesn't need the rest of those and like you said you're just going to urinate it out or sweat it out but then why put so much pressure on on the rest of the organs if that's the case and if there's a way of fixing that naturally why even bother spending the money on the multivitamins or the individual vitamins for example iron is best absorbed when it's combined with vitamin c Otherwise, iron in itself, in a chemical form, in a pill form, does not necessarily want to stay in our body. So if I'm iron deficient, what I would do is I would probably make myself an apple, kale, and lemon cocktail. There's my iron, there's my vitamin C, and something to flavor it up and have a couple of glasses a week. Nothing more than that. See how that feels before putting any supplements, any chemical uh, additives, vitamins into my system. Um, I I agree with you. I think there's a lot of uh, misleading information there as well. And pharmaceuticals, it's a huge, it's a huge organization, right? Everywhere around the world. And they love it when you get sick. So... For example, I, I when I was doing bodybuilding back when we first met, I was religiously taking these supplements, and most of them are different types of mushroom powders and spirulina. And what you're meant to do is you're meant to do this for three months, and then you need to stop for a month. So you overload your body, right? Then you deprive your body. Once you deprive your body, The next time you use these supplements, your body soaks it up because it's been deprived. 
But over that three-month course, because it's been there consistently for so long, your body just throws it out and you're wasting money. And like I said, again, you're putting a lot of uh, a load on your liver and your kidney and even your gut health. Like it changes the bacteria in your guts. It has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. Um, actually, in that sense, like um, when, when we talk about uh, weight loss, we also, like for me personally, I take whey protein. Some people take some BCAAs mm. for supplements. Yeah. Um, mm. Does it apply the same concept that you should go on and off? Uh, or is it even sure. necessary? Absolutely. Look, it depends on your actual diet. So I'm going to give an example from someone uh, that was very close to me, a competitor, and he could not use BCCA at all. So much so that if there was the smallest scoop in an entire container, within minutes he would feel sick and he would say, this has BCCA in it. So, again, it's very, very individual. Now, if this person was not eating the amount of protein that he should be eating, then of course he needs a protein supplement. But then if you're eating enough protein and having protein supplement on top of that, you can end up with lymph node issues where your body can't process the protein anymore. It's too much. It starts storing it and you end up with infections and sore spots around your body, around here, under the arms and so on. And that's excess protein. It has this particular name. I don't know the name now, but too much of anything is not good, right? So, and again, it's the individual. Maybe somebody else does need tons and tons of protein and it's nothing for them. It causes no issues for them. But other people react badly. So it also mm-hmm. emphasizes the fact that we should be listening more to our bodies. Um, the bodies talk to us. For sure. I think, uh, in yeah. the interest. and uh, maybe yeah. lastly for this um, meeting, uh, what about alcohol? What do you? What can you say about yeah. alcohol? <sighs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I think too much, just like too much of anything, it's it's a depressant first of all. So, if you are someone who's prone to depression, if you are someone who's sensitive and is prone to anxiety and panic attacks and so on, I would probably say completely stay off alcohol. If you're someone who can have a glass of wine here and there, you can still go to sleep after that, no problem. If you start looking into drinking every day, even just a glass or even just a can of beer, you're just harming your body. Um, one of the things about alcohol is the sugars in the alcohol. And again, that changes your gut, gut bacteria. So you would think one beer, you know, how bad can it be? Yes, it's one beer once a day for a year. That's a lot. So it is going to strip the lining of your stomach. It's going to strip the lining of your intestines. Eventually it's going to affect your liver Um, you're not going to be able to sleep as much. You're going to start depending on it. When you don't have it, you're going to start getting depressed. When you do have it, first you're going to feel happy. Then you're going to start feeling depressed again. Um, So it's a vicious cycle. It's If you can avoid it, just avoid it. For a happy occasion, have a few. But don't make it a daily thing or even a weekly thing. Um, there's no need to kill the brain cells that are not going to regenerate. You say the, the funny thing is, I think I've seen something that if you drink wine every day, it's good for weight loss. <laughs> I know. Uh, there's yeah. something, something like that, with, especially with red wine. Mm. And um, I, 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 I'm really curious about that too, because I come from a family of heavy, heavy drinkers. You know, uh, when we're sad, we drink. When we're happy, we we drink. When we're angry, we drink. We just look for a reason to drink, okay? So the problem there, a small glass of wine a day is good for you and so on. Alcohol is not good for you at all. 
So what's in the wine that's good for you? Is it the fact that it's grapes? Is it the fact that it's fermented? Is it the fact that it makes you feel a little bit tipsy? Like, like what, what is good about it? I don't know. I would rather drink fermented juice instead of alcohol because if we're relying on the content of it and we definitely know that it's not the alcohol that's good for us, then I'd rather drink that. So I don't know, a glass of wine a day. Yeah. And, and I think just for I can't the agree with that. A purpose of education, um, mm. carbs and protein is four grams, uh, four, how do you say? One gram uh, of pound. Yeah, yeah. One gram of carbs and protein is equals to four calories. Yes. Is that correct? I'm getting confused. And while fats and alcohol is eight, yes, nine calories per nine calories. Yeah. Yeah. Gram. Yeah. So if yeah. So food. yeah, that that. Okay. See, the Russians are very clever about this. Okay. <laughs> so they found a way around it. What you do is you drink vodka, which has no carbs. However, it's very high in calories. So you can drink vodka and go for a run. And you're still in ketosis. No, I'm joking. I'm completely uh, joking. Don't look at me. You got, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. But, but actually, uh, the... The information is actually correct. It's uh, low low carbs but high in calories, uh, whereas most other alcohols, um, wine and so on, beer especially, they're both high in calories and high in carbs. So if you're looking at any low-carb diet, no alcohol at all. If you're looking at a healthy lifestyle, just moderate it. Every now and then, have a drink, enjoy yourself. Don't make it a habit, and definitely don't incorporate it into your daily routine. Right. So yeah. um, if, I think we can summarize for now. Um, so we, we've talked about um, emphasis on the individual, the emphasis yeah. on um, uh, listening to your body, understanding how your body reacts, and moderate moderation in taking yes whatever it is. Um, mm-hmm changing and introducing changes to your body and how to adapt to it. Yeah. Um, let's say what? we talked about consistency. consistency. So if you were to try a, a, a new diet, try it at least for 30 days. Um, try and keep a diary of your nutritional intake just so you can see the reaction that it causes for you. And that can be any kind of reaction, you know, just make a note and uh, if, it, if after 30 days you've been consistent, you've kept a diary and it still didn't work for you, try and figure out for yourself as an individual as to why you think it might have not worked. Yeah. And once you unlock that, then you can look into it further. If you can't figure it out, go to a GP, get a blood test done, um, check out thyroid levels, insulin levels, cortisol levels, and all other um, blood works that are available to your budget. And from there, you can help yourself. Right. And then mm-hmm. uh, eating clean, uh, 30 kilometer. Sure. Uh, the radius, yeah. And I really like that. But, yeah. um, what else? Yeah, it is so cool because, I mean, that's what people used to do, right? I mean, yeah. when, when they couldn't go and, I mean, walk to Macca's, they would just go and get some fish. Yeah, because if you, if you no, know, if they, people in the older times uh, or in the farms in the provinces, they're all yeah. pretty much healthier than most people in the city where we have most yes. available to us. It's kind of yes. kind of makes you but ask. What's, uh, like you said, you, you nailed it, you know, when you said what's available to us, which is junk, is cheaper than what's available to us which is healthy and that's so true and that's the sad reality so whatever you can get local and fresh just try and use that right that's yeah, the best thing you can do okay i i think i've covered much for today um would you would you Absolutely. like to add something or anything anything at all here if you need me 
anytime, give us a call, have another Zoom. And thank you for having me. Ah, no, it's my, it's my pleasure having you here in this channel. And I, I'm sure the audience are appreciating uh, our conversation for today. Um, yeah. If you guys have any questions, um, direct it to me first. I will direct it to Alex uh, myself. And perhaps if we have um, a substantial amount of interest in a specific topic, then perhaps we can make another video about it. And um, yeah. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for being yeah. here. <laughs> really appreciate cool. it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Justin. All right, so uh, all right, that's it, guys. Uh, if you like this video, we're going to uh, post this soon. And um, do hit the subscribe button for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video. Ciao. Mm -hmm.